I'm Jennifer Kuhn with the Legislative Analyst Office, and this webcast is intended to highlight the findings and recommendations from a report we recently released on the state's Proposition 98 budget. So in the next few minutes, I wanted to share with you our assessment of the governor's overall funding level for Proposition 98, turn to our assessment of the gov governor's overall spending plan, and then shift and talk about our alternative Proposition 98 budget plan. And the purpose of our alternative is twofold, to provide both an overall, a uh, better overall approach, as well as a broader array of options for the legislature in building its own education budget. So starting with the governor's overall funding level, the governor provides $50 billion in ongoing Proposition 98 support. And the governor believes that this is sufficient to meet the Proposition 98 minimum guarantee. And the minimum guarantee is the term that's used to reflect the minimum funding requirement that the state must meet for K-14 education under the parameters of the Constitution. So the governor provides $50 billion. Of this amount, $42.5 billion is for K-12 education, $6 billion is for the community colleges, and $1.5 billion is for child care and development programs. Although this is roughly flat funding from the prior year, schools would still be taking a cut of almost $2 billion from last year. And this cut is primarily a result of last year, the legislature relied relatively heavily on one-time solutions. So it supported ongoing program with one-time monies that are no longer there to support the program moving forward. So though the legislature could fund at the governor's proposed $50 billion level, we think the governor's plan is tenuously held together and has some legal risk. Most importantly, the governor's plan makes various assumptions about how to interpret the Constitution, as well as makes various assumptions about which revenue proposals will be adopted. If the governor's constitutional interpretation were to be challenged, or if a different revenue package were to be adopted ultimately, his plan could easily, very quickly, become unworkable. So to ensure that the legislature can identify all of its funding options, we, prevent, we present two alternative courses of action. One is for the legislature to suspend Proposition 98. This would require a two-thirds vote of the legislature. But under suspension, the legislature could fund at whatever level it deemed necessary, at whatever level it deemed it could afford. From a constitutional perspective, suspending Proposition 98 would be the safest course of action. And from a practical perspective, it would provide the legislature with the most flexibility, both in crafting its ed budget and in crafting the overall state budget. Alternatively, though, the legislature could try to meet the higher current year funding level, which we estimate is about $3 billion higher than the governor's proposed level. If the legislature wanted to fund at this higher level, it could either make cuts to non-education programs or raise substantially more revenue and dedicate virtually all of that extra revenue to education, or it could do any mixture or combination of the two. After the legislature decides what funding level it wants to provide for Proposition 98 programs, it then needs to decide how to spend those monies. So turning then to the, our assessment of the governor's spending plan. We think that there are four generally positive aspects of the governor's spending plan. And in our report, we analyze each of his specific proposals, but taken together, we think he's headed generally in the right direction for four reasons. He does find some ways to try to reduce costs. For example, then, rather than just cutting schools and community colleges, he tries to find, find ways to identify how programs might operate more efficiently and thereby achieve savings. Secondly, he tries to find ways to give districts additional flexibility to weather these tight times. Third, he tries to find ways to get more federal aid. And finally, his plan doesn't rely on any additional new inter-year borrowing. So he, um, his plan supports ongoing program with ongoing resources, such that there's no hole moving forward for the state or for school districts. While we think the plan moves in generally the right direction, we still think it misses many opportunities. We think it misses opportunities to reduce state and local costs, that it doesn't go far enough in maximizing flexibility that it misses opportunities to undertake meaningful mandate reform, that it misses opportunities to align complementary program efforts, 
and that it misses opportunities to fully leverage federal aid. So what our alternative tries to do then is build on the positive aspects of the governor's plan, but make various improvements in these particular areas. So in conclusion, I just wanted to share the major components of our alternative. We first start by weighing the priorities between these three areas of government, K-12 education, community colleges, and child care and development. So under our plan, we look back over the last few years, and for these three areas, we assess the level of cuts they've taken since 2007-8, and then we weigh various other factors, including the different populations, needs, programmatic quality, and public benefits that these three areas of education provide. After trying to assess all of these different factors, our alternative cuts child care programs about $100 million less than the governor, identifies about $800 million in targeted cuts for K-12 education, and then recommends that if any additional cuts are needed, they be taken through some combination of general purpose and categorical funding. And then we, we raise new revenue for the community colleges through a $14 per unit fee increase. Given that these reductions, perhaps other reductions might be needed, we also encourage the legislature to couple these reductions with a flexibility package. And our report contains a flexibility package that has about a dozen new options for giving schools and community colleges additional flexibility. One of our major flexibility components is related to mandate reform. So we offer flexibility not only by removing certain restrictions on categorical programs, but also removing certain restrictions from mandated activities. As opposed to the governor who just suspends all K-14 mandates, we assess each of the state's existing 51 education mandates on a case-by-case -case basis in a few cases, we recommend funding them, and in most cases, we recommend eliminating them. Under our mandate package, the state would have about $30 million in costs each year, but save more than $350 million in costs each year. We have two other components of our package. One relates to trying to take certain existing program efforts and do better alignment. We focus on three areas, school improvement, education data and technology, um, and career technical education. And in each of these areas, we find ways where certain restrictions can be removed, and accountability can be enhanced, and districts can have a little bit more latitude to still run comparable programs more efficiently and we hope effectively. In one of these areas, school improvement, we're also able to achieve substantial state savings by virtue of making these existing program efforts more complementary and more in alignment. The last component of our package is to seek additional federal funding in two areas, special education, and then to achieve more funding from a federal tax credit that's associated with college fees. So to wrap up, we know that the state is facing a difficult budget year, um, and that given the reductions the state has made over the last few years, the choices it face, faces this year are likely to be even more daunting. The objective of our analysis is to help the legislature identify its options and to weigh the associated trade-offs. Particularly in this environment, we are encouraging the legislature to consider multiple strategies, to not only consider ways to um, reduce spending on lower priority activities, but also to explore ways to maximize flexibility, efficiency, program alignment, and federal aid. So we hope that you found these highlights helpful. And again, you can find additional information and detail in our report. So thank you for listening.